There's a lot of misinformation about the Titanic out there. Many channels on YouTube and documentaries which claim to be educational will make outlandish claims regarding the ship. This is despite the overwhelming availability of evidence regarding the event. The Titanic Inquiry Project is a great website where the entirety of the Senate and Board of Trade Inquiries are available to view with ease. Famous books on the subject, such as Honesty of Glass, have huge lists of sources in their footnotes that can tell you exactly where ideas about the event come from. However, many Titanic enthusiasts repeat claims without directly citing the primary evidence. This mistake creates a situation where the story of the Titanic is repeated like a game of telephone, getting more and more distorted the further along the line it goes. Similarly, the lack of adequate testimony to back up claims made about the sinking of the Titanic leads to a romanticized visualization of the event based upon films and other Titanic media. This picture replaces the role of actual evidence and enthusiasts make claims based upon it instead of testimony. In this video, we will discuss two situations in which these biases are present. We will begin by discussing the controversies surrounding Harold Bride's escape from the Titanic, and follow this up with a discussion of whether Frederick Fleet or William Murdoch spotted the iceberg first. The current paradigm surrounding Harold Bride's escape from the Titanic is built on weak ground. What is currently repeated is essentially what plays out in the film The Last Signals by Tom Linsky. Harold Bride is helping push collapse will be off the roof of the officer's quarters, but is thrown off the roof and lands onto the deck, as B lands upside down on top of him. Then, as water overcomes the deck, the collapsible is lifted off of Bride and he swims away before rejoining the boat later on. There's a fair amount of testimony to support this claim. During day two of the American Senate inquiry, Harold Bride has this exchange with Senator William Alden Smith. There were no big lifeboats on the ship at that time. There was a collapsible boat on the top deck at the side of the forward funnel. What was done with it? It was pushed over onto the boat deck. You never saw it? Yes, I went over with it. I understand what the second officer said about it. I want to know whether you saw it again. Yes, sir. It went over the side of the ship. It was washed off by a wave. It was washed over the side of the ship by a wave? Yes, sir. And fell into the water? Yes, sir. Bottom side upward? Yes, sir. And how far were you from the water when you saw this boat fall? I was in the boat. You were in the boat? Yes, sir. It fell the bottom side upward? Yes, sir. What became of you? I was inside the boat. You were under the boat? Yes. You remained under the boat how long? I should say about three quarters of an hour. Or a half. Which side of the boat was that on? Port or starboard? On the port side of Titanic. Did you hear the second officer yesterday say that the boat came around from the starboard to the port side? I was not here yesterday. You cannot say as to that? It went straight over the port side, sir. It went straight over the port side? It was on the port side of the forward funnel. We pushed it on the port side of the boat deck, and it went over the port side of Titanic. Did it at any time get on the starboard side? Not to my knowledge. This exchange with Senator Smith clearly supports the idea that Bride ended up under the collapsible boat just as it was thrown off the roof of the officer's quarters. This places Bride under the lifeboat before it was washed off the deck. However, this is not his only mention of the situation. On April 19, 1912, the New York Times filled their front page with this headline, Thrilling Story by Titanic Surviving Wireless Man. This article contained what was essentially the first interview of a Titanic survivor by the press. In it, Bride describes his escape. I went to the place where I had seen the collapsible boat on the deck, and to my surprise I saw the boat, and men still trying to push it off. I guess there wasn't a sailor in the crowd. They couldn't do it. I went up to them, and I was just lending a hand when a large wave came awash of the deck. The big wave carried the boat off. I had hold of an oarlock, and I went off with it. The next I knew I was in the boat, but that wasn't all. I was in the boat, and the boat was upside down, and I was under it. I remember realizing I was wet through, and that whatever happened I must breathe, for I was under water. I knew I had to fight for it, and I did. How I got out from under the boat I don't know, but I felt a breath of air at last. There were men all around me, hundreds of them. The sea was dotted with them, all depending on their life belts. If we corroborate what other witnesses have said, this account places Bride approaching collapse will be as it is already on the boat deck. He does not mention throwing it off the officer's quarters, instead he only mentions it being washed off by a wave. Similarly, the lifeboat is washed off the deck before Bride becomes trapped inside it. This describes a seemingly different story, where a wave washes Collapsible B off the boat deck and Bride is swept under it. He remains under not while Collapsible B is on the boat deck, but instead while Collapsible B is swept around the front of the ship. 
This would also explain why Bride claimed that Clash will be remained on the port side, while Lightoller claimed it crossed from port to starboard. Bride was trapped in a completely dark and disorienting air pocket. He would likely not have been able to see this transition. Furthermore, if Bride was wearing a life belt, it would have been pinning him to the bottom of the lifeboat, preventing him from climbing out. The story is corroborated with a later exchange between Bride and Smith during the same day of testimony. How did you get in it? When it was pushed over onto A deck, we all scrambled down onto A deck again. You all scrambled in? We did not scramble in. We scrambled down onto A deck and were going to launch it properly. Then what happened? It was washed overboard before we had time to launch it. The boat was washed over? Yes, sir. You then went down with it? I happened to be nearest it and I grabbed it. You grabbed it and went down with it? Yes, sir. Did anyone else grab it? No, sir. You went down with it alone? Yes, sir. It fell in such a shape that you were under it? Yes, sir. This exchange adds more to the original story. Bride mentions that he was present when the boat was pushed off of the officer's quarters onto the boat deck, despite him mistakenly referring to it as a deck. He and the others present then scrambled down to the boat deck to launch it properly. However, the boat was washed overboard before they could do so. Bride happened to be nearest and he grabbed it. He was then washed overboard with the lifeboat and ended up underneath it. If you've ever been held down by a wave at the beach, you may be able to understand this feeling. You're simply tumbling around until you're suddenly thrown out somewhere random. For Bride, this random place was underneath Collapsible B. Furthermore, Bride claims that how I got out from under the boat, I don't know. There's a certain event that Bride fails to mention which can give us an insight into how he got out. Charles Lightoller, in his own testimony, describes the forward funnel collapsing and sweeping Collapsible B away from the ship. If a big wave can wash Bride under Collapsible B, then it could surely wash him away from it as well. Similarly, if Bride was underneath the boat as the funnel fell, then this would explain why he never saw the funnel fall. In summary, this analysis claims that Harold Bride helps push Collapsible B off the officer's quarters. He then climbs down to the boat deck to help launch it. While preparing the upturned lifeboat to be floated off the ship, a wave suddenly washes over the port side. Bride grabs onto an oarlock on the collapsible as it is washed off the ship, and in the tumbling water he ends up underneath it. He's disoriented and unaware of the situation as he is swept from port side to starboard side. Finally, he does not notice Titanic's forward funnel collapse, but the wash created by the funnel pushes collapsible B off of him. He clears himself from the lifeboat before returning soon afterwards. The discrepancy between the accepted story and the interpretation just presented illustrates the issues with the way the Titanic enthusiast community operates. Many enthusiasts keep to themselves a tacit list of trusted creators regarding the Titanic. The gauge of how this trust is created is itself faulty. These creators are only trustworthy as an optical distinction. They represent going against the grain of what has been portrayed in the mainstream about the Titanic. While the mainstream is generally an absolute hellhole for Titanic knowledge, these creators themselves are not entirely infallible. In this case, the story of Harold Bride's escape is repeated quite often without a second look at the actual testimony. If you consider yourself an expert on the Titanic, then when one of these creators makes a claim, you should either be waiting for them to verify it with a primary account, or you should look for the account yourself. If you cannot find the account, you should be skeptical of the entire claim. Many authority figures surrounding the sinking of the Titanic claim that the crew on the bridge likely spotted the iceberg before the lookouts in the crow's nest. The idea for this claim stems from the testimony of Frederick Fleet, who discusses Titanic's movements upon spotting the iceberg on day four of the Senate inquiry. She started to go to port while I was at the telephone. My mate saw it and told me. He told me he could see the bow coming around. He said nothing much. He just started looking. He was looking ahead while I was at the phone, and he seen the ship go port. He similarly has this exchange with Senator Theodore Burton on day five. Did you notice how quickly they turned the course of the boat after you sounded the gongs? No, sir. They did not do it until I went to the telephone. While I was at the telephone, the ship started to move. It was going right ahead, as far as we knew, but when I was at the phone, it was going to port. You could see that yourself? Yes, sir, after I got up from the phone. Fleet describes Lee telling him that Titanic begins to turn while he is on the phone with the bridge. Once Fleet puts the phone down, he verifies this for himself, that Titanic is turning. At first, this sounds quite compelling. If Titanic was already turning while Fleet was on the phone with the bridge, then the bridge must have spotted the iceberg at least a few seconds before, giving Murdoch time to order hard to starboard and Hitchens time to begin turning the helm hard over. However, this is not corroborated by both Reginald Lee and Robert Hitchens. On day 14 of the Board of Trade inquiry, Lee describes what he saw. As soon as the reply came back, thank you, the helm must have been put either hard to starboard or very close to it. 
because she veered to port, and it seemed almost as if she might clear it, but I suppose there was ice underwater. Where Fleet places Lee's observation of the ship beginning to turn while Fleet was on the phone, Lee himself places the ship beginning to turn as soon as the reply came back. This places the entirety of the matter on what Lee intended the subject of as soon as to be. It could either be the ship itself turning, or Lee assuming the action of putting the helm hard over. Luckily, Robert Hitchens, the only surviving witness to the actions on the bridge, settles the dispute. All went along very well until 20 minutes to 12 when three gongs came from the lookout, and immediately afterwards a report on the telephone. Iceberg right ahead. The chief officer rushed from the wing to the bridge, or I imagine so, sir. Certainly I am enclosed in the wheelhouse and I cannot see, only my compass. He rushed to the engines. I heard the telegraph bell ring. Also give the order, hard a starboard, with the sixth officer standing by me to see the duty carried out, and the quartermaster standing by my left side. Repeated the order, hard a starboard, the helm is hard over, sir. Hitchens likely would not have been able to hear Moody's discussion with Fleet over the phone. Therefore, his mention of the phrase, iceberg right ahead, is almost certainly Moody shouting the report to Murdoch, then the order, hard a starboard, comes only after this report. Therefore, Lee's use of as soon as is likely referring to Lee assuming the helm was put hard over, and then the ship turning a few seconds afterwards. Based on the Olympics wartime record, it is reasonable to assume that Titanic was a well-maneuvering ship. Therefore, Lee was likely commenting on how he would have expected the reaction to take even longer than it did. However, this explanation does not fully take into account why Fleet thought Lee told him the ship began turning, when Lee makes no mention of this. To that, there are already discrepancies between the comments of the lookouts. With regards to the haze, Reginald Lee mentions on day 14 of the Board of Trade Inquiry that Fleet said, well, if we can see through that, we'll be lucky. However, when Fleet was asked to corroborate this claim, he responded, well, I never said that. Therefore, it's possible that whatever Lee said in the moment was misinterpreted or misrepresented by Fleet. It surely would have been difficult to hear at that moment, with the relative wind created by the forward movement of the ship at 22 knots directly in their ears. In total, Lee's inability to corroborate Fleet's claim along with Hitchens' testimony of Murdoch and Moody's actions, make the idea that the bridge spotted the iceberg prior to the lookouts absolutely unfounded. I'm certain that everyone views the iceberg collision through the depictions in A Night to Remember and James Cameron's Titanic. To this effect, we likely envision Frederick Fleet holding the crow's nest phone to his ear while standing at his station on the port side, looking ahead at the iceberg. This image ignores the testimony of Fleet himself, who describes having to move to the starboard side to use the phone, while Lee looks ahead on behalf of them both. Furthermore, trying to use a phone in the relative wind of 22 knots created by the ship's movement is a tall order. Fleet likely had to protect the phone's microphone from the wind so Moody would be able to hear him. A more accurate image would be a Fleet buried next to the mast while Lee continues looking ahead, with both of them on the starboard side of the crow's nest. However, the image of Fleet looking directly at the iceberg while phoning the bridge reserves him credibility. He was in a perfect position to judge the speed at which the actions on the bridge were taking place. With this image, it makes sense that people believe the lookout spotted the iceberg after the bridge. Taking Fleet's own testimony into account changes this picture completely. Fleet was not able to judge the haste of the bridge relative to the phone call, as he was not looking ahead. This changes the focus onto Lee, who does not corroborate the viewpoint that action was taken while Fleet was on the phone within his own testimony at the Board of Trade Inquiry. As a lesson to take away from this analysis, Titanic enthusiasts must free themselves from the movie portrayals stuck in their head. These portrayals are filmmakers being forced to come to a definite decision, often at a whim, about how to direct a scene. Historical accuracy comes second to the spectacle, and in studies where historical accuracy is paramount, one must attempt to disregard the subconscious bias towards the films, as within them, the spectacle is inseparable from bits of history included. This video is ultimately directed at the people who call themselves Titanic enthusiasts or Titanic experts. People often give themselves this title when they realize they have a better understanding of the sinking of the Titanic than the average person. However, this in itself is not a difficult feat, and the barrier to entry is rather low. The current tacit standard is to simply be able to point out a few errors in the 1997 movie and to maybe have watched A Night to Remember, but this is far too low. As a community, we can do better. We need to break away from the colloquialisms that we have all recognized as absolute for far too long. Instead, we must recognize that every single person's Titanic knowledge is fallible, including our own. Every time you try to repeat a fact about the Titanic to someone else on a forum post or Discord server, do your best to include the source. If this order is too much for you, then you do not deserve the title of Titanic Expert.